Well, I'm glad that you've clicked on this video. If you haven't uh, been able to catch the teaching on prayer yet, I suggest you maybe click over there and watch that video first because this is a really a companion video as a part of a prayer and fasting. Uh, I think it's important that we understand from the beginning that prayer and fasting are inextricably linked. When we look at scripture, we'll never find fasting without prayer right in its midst. And so for us to be followers of Christ, to be good at fasting and prayer is, as, a, as someone who's walked with Christ for a long time, I can't think of a more fundamental um, act or process to do as a Christian. And so I want to talk a little bit about this. I'm sure you clicked on this to learn a little bit more about fasting because I found that it's not a topic that's very well known or there's a lot of maybe misunderstanding about fasting. And so what I want to do for you today is to just do a simple Bible search that you can do. And what I've done to prepare for this teaching is I've, I've taken a study Bible. I have an NIV study Bible. I opened to the very back, which is called the concordance. I looked up fast and fasting and there found about 60 references in scripture on, on fasting. And so I just want to take uh, a, a brief review of scripture and what it has to say about fasting. I'm just cherry picking a few passages. So I would encourage you to find a concordance and look for yourself and, and read further on this from scripture. But then also, if you look down below this video, you'll find a link there to Campus Crusade for Christ International, uh, now known as Crew. You can click on the link there and read uh, an excellent uh, toolbox, I guess is what I would call it, on fasting and, and prayer, actually. And, and so click on that and, and, and look more into this because it's going to do even more detail work than I can do here in this video. And so I want to look at scripture because fasting is actually an ancient practice that we find almost from the very beginning in scripture. We find it, uh, the first place I would like to go with you is actually in the book of Judges, where we find the tribes of Israel are, are fighting one another. And it's in Judges chapter 20, verses 26, and we'll see where we go on that. So Judges 20, 26, um, the Israelites are actually fighting the tribe of Benjamin. There's infighting going on because there's been trouble. And uh, the, the Israelites have actually attacked the tribe of Benjamin. And there's been over 40,000 men from Israel that have been killed in the battle. And the people are wondering, are we in the right with this? And verse 26 begins, Then the Israelites, all the people, went up to Bethel, and there they sat weeping before the Lord. They fasted that day until evening and presented burnt offerings and fellowship offerings to the Lord. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord. And so I, right there we see the, the power of fasting. The people aren't sure what's going on. They want to know what the truth of the Lord is in this moment in their history. And so their response is they all, all the people go up to Bethel and they fast and they pray, seeking uh, the word of the Lord. What does the Lord want us to do? And in fact, as the, the, the text goes on, they asked, shall we go up again, of the Lord they asked, shall we go up again to battle with Benjamin, our brother, or not? They're asking this big question. We're fighting a fellow um, brother, Israelite uh, clan. Should we continue this? Maybe all of these losses are you telling us, Lord, that we shouldn't pursue this? But the Lord responded and says, go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. And so the response by the Lord, his response to his people coming to him in prayer and fasting is to give an answer. They, they found a direct answer. So if you're looking and seeking, Lord, what do you want from me? The text of the scripture tells us a good place to find that out is to pray and to fast and to seek the Lord. And so that's really, I, I, if I am right, I think I am, that this is the first instance we really kind of encounter fasting. 
But the way it's told to us, it's, it's clear that this was a practice they were already doing. It's just the first encounter we see in scripture. So the Israelites knew that when they want to hear from the Lord, that's where they should go, to their knees and, and, and intentionally depriving themselves of food that they might seek the Lord. And so when we want to know what the Lord wants for us, that's where we go. The second place I want to go is actually 2 Samuel chapter 12. And starting, let's see, in verse 15. Now this is dropping in in David's life. This is after he um, has um, slept with Bathsheba and a child is conceived and then is born. Um, uh, Nathan, the prophet, comes to David in verse 15. After Nathan had gone home, the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife had born to David and he became ill. David pleaded with God for the child. He fasted and went into his house and spent the nights lying on the ground. So a second reason that we see in scripture, just in a brief uh, interaction with it, is King David. He's made huge mistakes. He's made sinful mistakes. And so when his child is, 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 he falls ill, David stops making sinful mistakes and starts doing the next right thing. And so one of the things we find ourselves, we're we're, we're in trouble, we we realize maybe we're far from the Lord. The next right thing is to stop and pray and fast. Now the, the answer did not come as David wished. His child died as a result of David's sin, it looks like. And yet David said, I I fasted for this purpose, and and that's what we should do. We're seeking the Lord. We want him to hear from us. And so I think that is an absolutely uh, legitimate and biblical reason to go to the Lord. You want the Lord to hear from you. Uh, Another section I want to go to in Scripture is 2 Chronicles chapter 20, and we're going to go to verse, well, let's start maybe in verse 1 of chapter 20 of 2 Chronicles. This is King Jehoshaphat. Uh, Some men come to him and give him some bad news, and he's deeply terrified. He's deeply fearful. Verse 1, after this, the Moabites, Ammonites, with some of the Muonites, a bunch of ites, they came to make war on Jehoshaphat. Some men came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the sea. It is already sitting in Hazazan Tamar. Alarmed, that means freaked out, that means scared to death, alarmed as a king. You've got a vast army breathing down your neck. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast, get this, for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. The text goes on and it, 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 it's uh, the Lord responds to the people coming together and praying and fasting. Once again, another seeking. Uh, in this instance, we have uh, the entire nation coming together as one to seek the Lord. Jehoshaphat was scared out of his mind and his first response was to turn to the Lord. If you're scared, if you don't know where to turn, the place to to do that is in prayer and fasting and turn to the Lord. Let's move on to Jeremiah 36, verses 6 through 8. And here we're going to see evidence from Scripture that fasting was a part of their natural pace of life. Okay? Okay? Chapter 36, let's turn to 36, and Jeremiah, I'm going to start with verse 4. So Jeremiah called Baruch, son of Neriah, and while Jeremiah dictated all the words the Lord had spoken to him, so he's been given a word of the Lord, from the Lord, and he wants to speak it to the people, but at this time he's not allowed into the temple. He can't address the people directly when they come for worship. And so um, he instructs Baruch, uh, or Barak, I'm not sure, Baruch, I think is how you're going to say it, but 
uh, wrote them uh, the words that Jeremiah gives him on the scroll. Then Jeremiah told Baruch, I am restricted. I cannot go to the Lord's temple. So you go to the house of the Lord on a day of fasting. So what we gather from this little drop in text of Jeremiah wanting to speak to the people is that he knows a good time to do that is during a time when the people are gathering for the purpose of prayer and fasting. And, and I say prayer and fasting because what do we know about fasting? It's always connected with prayer. And read to the people from the scroll the words of the Lord that you wrote as I dictated. Read them to all the people of Judah who come in from their towns. Perhaps they will bring their petition before the Lord and will each in turn, uh, will turn from their wicked ways and uh, for the anger and the wrath pronounced against them, the people, uh, against the people uh, by the Lord are great. Jeremiah is instructing the people that they're coming for a time of prayer and fasting. I want to land on the fact that this is a regular part of what they're doing as a part of their worship. Would we say that fasting has become a regular part of our time in worship of the Lord? I wonder why not. It hasn't been. That's why we're talking right now. That's why the leadership of Crosspoint really in, are imploring you to, to start doing this. As we see these pages of scripture unfolding, we think, wow, this is an ancient practice. Did Jesus ever fast? Well, let's go to Mark or Matthew chapter 4 and, uh, and look. And, and I think you know what the answer is, is going to be. The answer is yes. And this Matthew 4 gives us this little snapshot of Jesus and it gives us the no kidding verse of all no kidding verses. Verse 1 then of chapter 4, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. This chapter 4 is right after his baptism. He's led into the desert. He's going to be uh, tempted by the devil. And it says in verse 2, after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. No kidding. Like, of course he was. But he fasted in a critical moment. He was placing himself in front, directly in front of the sights of the enemy, the Satan, the opposer. And in preparation for that, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in what we've come to call a supernatural fast. You and I, it's very difficult to fast for that long. But that, that day, uh, Jesus did this just days before, 40 days before being tempted, tells you that fasting and praying are a critical thing to do in, in, in the pace of your walk with the Father. That's why Jesus did it. He's following the, the lead of his Father. And so did Jesus fast from the beginning of his ministry, before he even started his public ministry, by and large. Here, here you have him saying, I need, to, I need to prepare for this momentous moment in my walk with the Father. And so another thing to think about, if you're about to partake on something that's momentous in your life, an appropriate thing is to prepare for it by prayer and fasting. And then just a couple of pages after this in, in chapter 6 uh, of Matthew, which is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, you have Jesus teaching on fasting. And in this whole section on, on the Sermon on the Mount, you have Jesus telling us his take on major uh, events and, and, and uh, major pieces of, of following him. He's giving us his um, take on teaching. And so in verse 16 of chapter 6, Jesus begins, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what's done in secret, will reward you. Now, did you catch 
the conditional clause that Jesus gives us. He said, if we fast, right? No, he didn't. He said, when we fast. I would refer back to Jeremiah when he's talking to Baruch and he says, hey, when the people are there fasting, proclaim what I give you on this scroll. Jesus is following in that same uh, vein. He's saying, when you fast, it Fasting is an expectation of a Christ follower. So we've jumped into the New Testament now, and Jesus is just continuing this thread of deep spiritual connection to the Father in heaven through fasting. And he's saying, don't do this in an unworthy way. This is not about you fasting and and people seeing you and you um, looking ultra spiritual. He's saying, no, don't do that for that purpose. Seek the Father's face out of a humble heart so that when you fast, do it in this way. Now, if someone finds out that you're fasting, it, does that discount your fasting? No, this is talking about a hard attitude about fasting, that look at me, I'm super spiritual and I'm amazing Christian. Follow me, follow my example. I don't, Jesus is saying, no, don't follow that example. Someone who, who understands fasting, they're gonna say, let's follow Jesus. Let's follow his leading in this. And I want to go to one more passage. I know it's been a few, but I want to go to one more passage because it moves us into the church age, into the book of Acts. A very momentous moment happens in Acts chapter 13. In that, there's been a northern beachhead of church in this, this town called Antioch. It becomes this new launching point for Christian message, the message of Christ, to launch from there. And uh, this... um, This group of Christians are are, are gathered together and they're worshiping. Chapter 13 of Acts, verse 1. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manain, Manain, who had been brought up with Herod to the Tetrarch, and Saul. Saul's an important figure. He eventually, his name's changed and he's called Paul. And he writes all the Ians. He writes Corinthians and Ephesians and Galatians and Romans. Well, not Romans, but Romans. All of these letters he's writing. He writes to Timothy. Um, he writes to Titus, Philemon. So this is the Saul, the Paul we're talking about here. He's with these, these Christians in Antioch. While they were worshiping the Lord, and it says, and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Now stop right there. Okay, I know I've broken the text there, but notice that fasting is connected to worship. Not only is it connected always to to, uh, prayer, but I would say that it is integrally a worship experience. The the text says that. It's making it an excellent point that when we fast and pray, we are worshiping. And even as we corporately fast and pray, we are corporately worshiping the one true God. We are worshiping the Father. We are, we, are, we are doing exactly what we should be doing. We are participating in a way that God looks and is proud. He is, is pleased with that behavior in us. And then the Holy Spirit, what did the Holy Spirit say? It said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed some more, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. A big moment of new ministry is happening within the church. It's by no mistake that the Lord allows this to be uh, taken down by Luke when he writes that they were in the midst of a worship experience and they were fasting and they were praying and they were worshiping the Lord. And then the Holy Spirit speaks. In the church today, for us at Crosspoint, if we want to hear the Lord speak to us, you know what we should do? We should fast and we should pray. And I hope just in this brief look through the scriptures, I've made my case. And so I want to ask some questions now. Is fasting expected to be part of following Christ? Well, how could we argue against it? I mean, it's a rhetorical question, but our answer must be yes. Our our answer must be not if, but when we fast, just like Jesus teaches in Matthew 6. So that 
it's a simple question, but I want to make, make it very clear that as a Christian, we should fast. Secondly, why is it not more a part of our American church landscape? I'm embarrassed to say the answer that I think, it, and that is because we, we enjoy a culture of excess. It's difficult, but we've been enculturated. We've been raised in excess. Um, the junk food generation has been called many times. The, we grew up on just eating, eating, eating. And the idea of denying ourselves is um, it's just not in our culture. And so if we want to be biblical and not follow the culture, we have to bring back fasting in our midst. It, it's, a, it's a mandate, I think. And I think another reason that we don't pray and we don't fast more than, than we do is because we're people of action. We like to be doing something. We like motion. Uh, I liken it to when I'm traveling with my family and the Google machine tells me that there is a traffic jam ahead. I would rather get off the main drag that I'm on, on the highway I'm on, and go on local roads because I want to keep moving. I'm, I, motion makes me feel like I'm getting somewhere. That is, we have to fight back against that cultural mindset that we have. And I, I want to give you a tagline that I want you to think about and use. Don't just do something, stand there. That takes a, a, a cultural colloquialism and turns it on its head. We want to say, don't just stand there, do something. But I think that the pages of scripture reveal, don't just do something, stand there. And standing there before the Lord, imploring him to speak to me, to speak to us, is doing something. It is action. It is the motion that moves God to tell us what he wants from us. It, it demonstrates to God in a physical way our heart attitude. We are bowed before the Lord. And so don't just do something, stand there. Seek the Lord. Ask of him what he wants. And so I think we have to fight against a cultural motion or, or, or direction in our lives that, that is almost ingrained in us and we don't even see it until someone points it out. And so hopefully I've made the case that you, you should be fasting. It is a biblical thing. Now let's ask a, just a couple of uh, specific questions or talk about some specifics. I think when we look at the pages of scripture, we see two basic types of fast. There's a partial fast and an absolute fast. Um, you can read more about this if you follow the link below. But briefly, partial fast means, and it's one, the partial fast is what I do a majority of the time in my own walk. It, it means that I deprive myself of, of chewable food and I just drink either water or juice. Something that's liquid, that's a sustenance. And uh, in that, that, that's a partial fast. So you're not completely cutting yourself off from, from intake of any kind. Um, I found that I, I, I just do better when I, have, I do a partial fast. The other one is an absolute fast, which is what we see, why we call it a supernatural fast that Jesus did. It was, he just, he, he quit taking everything in. An absolute fast, you take nothing in. You deny yourself everything. And uh, that's, that's one that leads to um, a, a bit of a caveat, a, a warning. Um, we need to make sure that we're physically able to do this, that we're emotionally able to do this, and that we're spiritually ready for this, because this is a deep spiritual practice. Uh, emotionally, th this, will, this will take us to places that are deep places with the Lord. Uh, it, it will connect you with the Holy Spirit. So I want, I want you to think about that. It's not a weight loss strategy. If you decide to do something more than a day or two of fast, ask your doctor whether that you're physically capable of doing this. Let, let a couple of people know if you're going to do a lengthy fast that you, you, you want, uh, want them to know because that you're going into the season of fasting. Um, if you're physically unable to fast, you can do other things. Deny yourself your phone. Deny yourself television. Deny yourself something that you regularly enjoy that would give you an opportunity to, to um, fast from something. And ultimately, let your hunger while you're fasting motivate you to pray 
and talk to the Lord. And so these are just some brief things that I hope encourage you. I want to encourage you to click the link below. I know I've taken some of your time up here. I hope it's benefited you and that you um, find the urge after listening to this and looking at scripture that fasting is going to become an integral part of your walk with the Lord. Thank you.